Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Burden Hour, hosted by SDSU Extension. My name is Christine Lang, and I'm an assistant professor and SDSU Extension Consumer Horticulture Specialist. And I'm so glad you all joined us this evening, and hopefully this means some folks are getting out of the heat. I know it was a toasty one over here in Brookings, South Dakota, where I'm based. Um, of course, the heat means that things are growing. It also is creating some pest and water management and plant stress challenges. So we look forward to digging into some of those problems with you tonight. And I especially look forward to having two special guests joining me for tonight's garden hour. Um, so we have two guests joining us. We have um, both from Brookings, so a little bit of East Side representation tonight. Um, but joining me tonight, we have Sydney Trio. And Sydney is the horticulturalist and education coordinator at McCrory Gardens. And Sydney, what are you going to be sharing tonight? Um, I'm going to be showing some neat varieties we have in the vegetable garden. Awesome. Well, I'm hungry already just thinking about it. <laughs> and making her garden debut, joining us from Woodville, Wisconsin originally, I'm really pleased to introduce Hannah Boy, who is one of my newest graduate students, co-advised by myself and Dr. Rhoda Burroughs. And Hannah started her research program in January, and she's been working diligently in the field, spent countless hours weeding this last week. And Hannah, what are you going to be sharing tonight? Um, I'll be sharing about my project um, on soil tarping. Awesome. And if folks have no idea what soil tarping is, stay tuned. You'll be hearing more from Hannah shortly. So without further ado, Sydney, we look forward to hearing about some of the vegetable varieties that you have growing at McCrory. There we go. I'll unmute first. All right. Well, thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Sydney Trio. I'm the education coordinator and horticulturist at McCrory Gardens. Um, last month, I kind of uh, talk to you about a little bit of our greenhouse production, how we kind of started from seed and then grew our plant into transplants. Um, now I'll be giving you a little update. Um, a little bit about who we are. We are part of SDSU, so we are in Brookings, South Dakota. And in 1965, we started off as a two acre research plot. And then today we've expanded to over 70 acres. Um, 45 of those acres shrubs out in the Arboretum, and um, we have the educator, Education and Visitor Center, um, and behind that we have about 25 acres of formal gardens. All right, everyone. I think we might have a slight computer glitch with Sydney's computer. Sydney, can you hear us by chance? Well, tell you what, I'm going to let Evan work with Sydney in the background and see if we can't get that resolved. And Evan, would you be able to possibly help us transition to our next presenter? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, sometimes this happens. We'll just say it's because of the heat and longest day. So, um, Evan, I'm going to let you maybe reach out to Sydney in the background and we're going to keep the show must go on. Um, so Hannah, without further ado, and maybe a little sooner than you were expecting, I would love to have you share your project on soil tarping. And thanks for jumping in and sharing what you, um, your, your slide set tonight. Sounds good. Let me just Pull up my screen quick. All right, can everyone see that all right? We can see that and um, that that photo of the scorched dry earth seems fitting for some of our drought conditions, depending <laughs> on where we are in the state. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, like we talked about before, uh, my talk will be on soil tarping. Um, that is my project with Dr. Lang. This uh, it started this January, so I've only been working at it for a couple of months now. 
Uh, but I've been learning so much and it's been a great experience um, learning about it. So on to, let's see if I can change slides. Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, a little overview of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, first of all, what is soil tarping and why is it used? And then I'll be going over two different soil tarping techniques that we are looking at specifically in our research. And then I'll give a couple of thoughts on securing your tarps well. And then we'll go on to any questions. So first of all, what is soil tarping? Well, it's kind of what it sounds like. It's covering soil with silage tarps or greenhouse plastic in order to reduce weeds before you plant. Um, so as you can see in these photos, uh, they're secured by sandbags and they can also be used up multiple years. Usually you want to wash off your greenhouse plastic so that technique can um, work the best that it can. And I'll be talking more about that later in the presentation. So why is soil tarping used? Well, for us um, in our research project, we're focusing mainly on how it can reduce early season weeds before you plant in the spring. And it can also protect against some of that early spring soil erosion. And then our research is also looking into temperature and moisture effects of soil tarping. So stay tuned for more on that as the year goes on. So like I said, our research is specifically studying two different soil tarping techniques. One of them is called occultation and the other one is called solarization. So first I'll be talking a little bit about what occultation is. And the word occultation basically means to exclude light. And the main goal of this technique is to delay your early season weed seeds from germinating. So weed seeds, they need light to germinate, right? So if we're cutting out that light, then we're stopping them from germinating. And for this technique, you usually use a black tarp, so it'll stop all the light from coming in. And I'll show you some pictures of the results. Um, this is an area where we tarped it for six weeks with a black silage tarp. And as you can see on that left photo, um, there's not a lot of weeds in there compared to the control plot in the photo on the right. Um, there's a lot less weeds, a lot more room for um, uh, the plants to easily go in there. But you can see, you might be noticing that there's some like white and yellow uh, little dots in there. That's some dandelions that were very stubborn and resistant. Um, but aside from those, the, it really took care of those annual weeds really well. So the next... Um, tarping technique that we're looking at is called solarization. And as you can see in the photos, this tarping technique, it uses clear tarps. So um, as you can see on that left photo, all of the edges of the tarp are buried. So this is, this is done in order to create a microclimate greenhouse effect. So the goal of this technique is to exhaust the weed seed bank. You want to get all of your weed seeds to germinate and grow, and you really want to exhaust that weed seed bank. So having all the edges buried, you're creating that microclimate, you're harnessing energy from the sun, um, you're harnessing that light. And as you can see in the second picture on the right, um, lots of weeds are growing in there. That's a six week tarp right there. It's been on there for six weeks. Uh, we applied our tarp in April. so it really jump-started those weeds coming in. And then what it looks like when it is all done, when the tarp is taken off, um, you can really see that it, it germinated lots of weeds. All of that brown stuff is weeds that germinated and then they died. So it's a little different depending on what climate you're, at, you're in to how um, the tarping will will work. So in warmer climates, um, the weed seeds will germinate, they'll come up, and then it can get so hot underneath that tarp that all of the weeds will die out. 
However, in our South Dakota Midwest climate, it's a little cooler, so not all of the weeds are going to die out. They'll germinate, but they won't all die out. So in order to prep your bed, when you have some of those weeds still on there, um, for our project, we used a BCS tiller and we tilled the ground very lightly just to get those weeds um, out, just to clear the bed for planting. Other farmers have used uh, flame weeders to help take care of that and get the bed ready. So I wanted to note a couple of things on securing your tarps well. Um, for the solarization treatment in the clear plastic, you always want to bury your etches because that'll keep the temperature high underneath there and it'll really give you your um, greenhouse microclimate that you want. Uh, we also added some sandbags because South Dakota is a windy place and you never know what's going to happen. Um, and then for black silage tarps, um, people usually just use sandbags um, or really anything with weight that you can find on your farm. Um, I've heard of people using boards, old tires, rocks. You can get pretty creative with it. You can also bury the edges of the... Um, black silage tarps if you want to. It just takes a little bit more time to do that. So that's something to keep in mind as you're considering um, what you what you want to do and, and how you want to secure your tarps. So a little summary of what I've talked about today. Um, soil tarping, it's an option for farmers to reduce weeds in unused areas and you can reuse those tarps for multiple years. And today I only told you about two different tarping techniques. Um, I told you about occultation and solarization, but there's a lot of other ways that you can use tarping um, for different things. Some people use them for terminating cover crops and um, different things like that. So yeah, stay tuned for more data from our project as the season goes on. There's a lot more to learn. Um, and thank you all for listening today. I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, here's my contact information. I'll leave it up for a few minutes here and turn it back to Dr. Link. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, if people have questions for Hannah, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A and I'll be sharing those with her to respond. And I also want to let everyone know that there's going to be a great opportunity um, Many of you heard from Alexis Barnes a few weeks ago. You've heard from Hannah. You're going to hear from several more graduate students. I just want to let everyone know to save the date that if you want to hear more from our graduate students and see these projects in person, we would love to have you in Brookings, South Dakota in September for our specialty crop field day. And that will be on Tuesday, September 12th in the late afternoon, early evening. So just know that there's a chance to come come see the results and see how the projects are doing in person. So Hannah, the first question we have is when you're using these different tarping methods, do the weeds come back quickly? And I know you have some lived experiences you can share um, based on tarp removal and some of your activities last week. So I'll let you weigh in on how that went. Yeah, so like Dr. Lang said, we just um, did our last our first, actually, we did our first weed biomass collection. And another tarp that I didn't discuss today, so we had three different tarp treatments, actually. We had a white tarp, a black tarp, and then a clear tarp. And the white tarping treatment was really just to look at temperature, because um, the black, the black um, tarps will definitely get hotter and the white ones, they still excluded light. So they had that aspect of them, but they were a little cooler. And what we noticed in those treatments is they definitely had a lot of more weeds come up right away after we took them off. And they were mostly grasses, which was interesting. Um, I'm not sure why that is yet, but as the research keeps unfolding, <laughs> we'll, we'll discover more. Um, so yeah, I think that was the biggest thing we noticed. And then I guess for our clear tarp treatments, I think because we tilled in that area um, and also because a lot of the weed seeds, like the weed seed bank was exhausted, not many weed, not as many weeds came up in that area as the black tarps. 
Um, so something to consider. I think the main goal of uh, the black tarp is really to allow your transplants to have a jump start before the weed seeds start germinating. So it's not necessarily killing out those weeds, but it's allowing your um, transplants and your crop that you actually want there to be able to jump start and have a head start on that competition in the area. Excellent, thank you. And Hannah, I know you transplanted out onions, which is a difficult weed to weed crop. So what were some of your weed management strategies for this first weeding event in terms of tools you used or things that worked well or maybe not so well? <laughs> yeah, so we actually did a lot of hand weeding. Um, and for our aisleways, we used a BCS tiller to get those aisle paths done really well. And then we also just used a hoe to like get in between the onions. We started with that. Each of the rows, we, we hoed out the weeds and then um, we went back through and, and hand weeded as much as we could. So there's a lot of weeding to do, <laughs> very laborious, but we got it done and I, I was proud of it. Excellent. Yes, if anyone needs tips on the best kind of stirrup hoe to use, Hannah might have some advice. Um, so Hannah, this is a timely question, um, and I'll let you maybe share with folks what your road trip is going to be next week. But Lance would like to know, how does tarping affect the soil microbiology? Do soil temps get hot enough to kill the soil life? Yeah, so this is still something that is new in our research. We haven't done too much in-depth, um, gotten too much in-depth information on it. Um, we do have some soil samples that are being sent into the lab to be analyzed. We haven't gotten that back yet. That's also part of next week's trip. Um, we're going West River to um, spend some time with our soil expert, Dr. Christopher Graham, and he's gonna help us analyze our soils, find the microbial activity, the microbial activity in them after tarping. Um, so that'll be a really interesting trip. I'm really intrigued to learn more about uh, soil analysis and how that works. Um, but as far as from what I've read in the literature so far, um, there really isn't a lot of information on that yet on soil microbial activity. And so that was kind of a drive to study that in our research is there's a gap in that research. So we're looking into it. Um, but yeah, from what I did see, I don't think there was much um, impacts of the soil microbial activity. And if there was, it may have went down, but then it bounces back up as the season goes on. So that's my little take on that, but stay tuned for <laughs> later in the next few years of learning more about this. Awesome. So Hannah, I'm gonna take the wrap up question with you. And I see that we have Sydney back and settling in with a good internet connection, but our first soil tarping event happened to be on a really windy day. And at one point, just for folks who are tuning in, the tarp was starting to blow away and um, the students got to watch their professor just jump on the tarp to try to hold it down. So Hannah, what advice, you know, any other advice for securing those tarps or number of sandbags or weight of sandbags or what should people know so that they don't come home and find that their garden area that they tried to tarp, the tarp is now in the next county? <laughs> yeah, so I would for our tarps, we had 10 by 24 foot tarps and we used about 25 to 30 sandbags on each of those. So there was a lot of sandbags and granted it was very, very windy the, the first day that we did it. So after like the wind calmed down, I don't think we really needed that many, but it was helpful to have it on just in case that giant gust of wind came through. Um, I would say another thing that really helped was even though it takes a little bit more time to do really burying your edges, um, that'll definitely help. So like a gust of wind doesn't catch a corner and then it just keeps blowing. Um, or just like throwing a little bit of soil on the middle of the tarp. I think I found that helped a little bit in securing them too. Um, 
Yeah, and then I just heard a lot about farmers being creative and using whatever they have around their farm, like a, a plank, an old tire, bricks, anything really that you have to, to hold it down helps. Awesome. We can manage weeds and clean up the yard at the same time. I like it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Hannah. And again, a reminder, if people have more questions for Hannah, or if you think of something as Sydney and I are presenting, um, you know, feel free again to drop that in the Q&A. She'll be with us all evening. And Sydney, I see you're in a new location. I hope this means internet connection is cooperating. And gosh, we've all been there. So I'm just glad you're able to rejoin us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about that. Hopefully this one works better. Yes, not a problem. Well, I'm happy to re-welcome you and I'll say you got through about the first slide and then then you went dark on us. So okay. feel free to jump in from the beginning and start fresh. We we always love seeing your photos and hearing what's going on at McCrory. So welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let me get my all right. Restart from the beginning. Alrighty. Well, my name is Sydney Trio. Um, I'm the education coordinator and horticulturist from Curry Gardens. Um, last month, I talked to you about the greenhouse process, um, growing from seed and then to transplants. And then um, we weren't quite to the stage where we brought them all to the shop yet, um, but I'll get there later. Um, but first up a little bit about Mercury. Um, we are part of SDSU. We are in Brookings, South Dakota. Um, it started off in 1965 as a two acre research plot. And today it is about 70 acres. Um, 45 of those acres are trees and shrubs out in the Arboretum and um, 25 is in the formal gardens. So yeah, um, a little bit of planting update. We finally got all of the plants moved and call it the great migration over to the shop yard. Um, we have about 40,000 plants that we start from seed, and then we plant them out throughout the gardens in the different themed gardens. Um, here's one of our employees, uh, Summer. Uh, she's super awesome, uh, planting the annuals in one of the containers. Um, but we did run into a little bit of a trouble on May 12th. We had to quickly, it was a Friday, and uh, the temperatures the next day were gonna get down to below 30. So we had to quickly um, cover up all of our plants. Um, so this one's in the big shop area. And then these two over here are in our vegetable garden. Um, we started planting our vegetable, gar vegetable garden and then this happened. So we're like, oh no, hopefully they've survived, but we got super lucky and they are still doing good. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about what's growing on in the vegetable garden. This is where I like to spend most of my time, whether it's with the kids doing educational programming or just pulling weeds. Um, I think there's a lot of cool, unique varieties in here, so I'm going to show you some today. Um, so today is actually, all well, this week is actually National Pollinators Week. So first up, we have some pollinators. We have Cosmos in the back um, and then some Calendula mixed in with zinnias and then marigolds and then sweet alyssums. So those are kind of planted along the outsides um, to attract pollinators like butterflies, bees, but we also have them mixed into the beds, which you'll kind of see later. Um, so when you first walk in, there's this bed right there. Um, this big uh, plant with the cage is the firefly cherry tomato. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's um, super sweet than I think most cherry tomatoes. That's probably why I like it. Um, along the outside are strawberry spinach. Um, they're not quite red yet, but when they are ready, they'll look like this and you can just pop them in your mouth. They're super good. And then we just have some basil on the outsides to fill in some space. Um, the next bed we have here in the corners are lemon eucalyptus. Um, whenever I bring the kids in there, they're always like, that smells like the stuff you use to get rid of mosquitoes. So it does have that really uh, citronella smell to it. Um, super, smells super good. And then here we have, we have them on each side is Swiss chard. A lot of times I show the kids and I ask them, what do you think this is? And they think it's rhubarb with the purple or the pink uh, stems, but then they see the different colors and realize that it's not rhubarb. 
Um, but a lot of people like to saute Swiss chard. Um, yeah, and then we just have some marigolds growing and then a pepper in the middle. Next up, we have the peanut plant on the outside here. Um, I don't think we've ever grown the peanut plant before, so I'm excited to see how that does here. But last year we did grow some cotton and our growing season isn't quite long enough for it, but late into the fall, it started flowering and then we were able to get some of the cotton. So I'm excited to see how it does in a um, raised bed this year compa compared to a container. So, and I added that it is part of the mallow family, the malavaceae. Um, and so hibiscus and hollyhock. Um, I should have added a picture because the flower does look a lot like a hibiscus, which is pretty cool. Um, next up, we have in okra. There's one right here, and then you can't really tell, but there's one on the other side there. Um, I've heard a lot of people like to can okra. I've never tried it, but um, I've heard that. And then in these two cages, we have a tomatillo, two, two tomatillos. Um, a lot of people like to make salsa out of those. And then some marigolds planted in. Next, we have a herb pyramid. Um, we have a lot of herbs in there like cilantro, basil, sage, lavender, um, probably anything you can think of. And then we have some apple mints and peppermints on the side. We put these in containers um, just kind of because the mints kind of like to spread. They've already way overgrown the container. So I think it was a good choice. Um, and then here we direct sowed some carrots and beets. So there's the carrots here. And then here, here's the beets. Um, last year we did grow the black nebula and it is a dark purple variety. And I learned, I took a bite of it and then I like looked at my hands and it was super purple. So then I looked in a mirror and my teeth and mouth were all purple. So if you wanna have like a fancy event with carrots, I would not recommend this one, but it is fun to try. And then some more beets. Um, so here's the carrots and beets here. Then we also have growing some bush beans and some purple potatoes. Uh, the cool season crops, we have like cabbage, kale, uh, kohlrabi, and then on this side we have some watermelons and then nasturtiums growing in there. And the flowers of nasturtiums are um, actually edible. So, And then in this bed here, we have a lemon cucumber growing up on this trellis here. Um, this is what it looks like. It, it doesn't really taste like a lemon. It just tastes like a regular cucumber, but it looks cool and something unique. Then we have some other cucumbers growing here in the bed. And then in the middle, we have some borage and some um, chives. Um, right here, we have a bunch of different varieties of peppers. I just picked two of them to show. And the first one is a pimiento pepper lipstick, um, super sweet. And then sugar rush peach. I'm definitely not brave enough to try that one. Then next we have some tomatoes growing along here. Um, the bigger heirloom tomatoes are in the, the silver ones. And then we have smaller red cages for the uh, cherry tomatoes. So the first one that I thought was cool and we've, we haven't grown yet, but I'm excited to see how it does this year is the Brad's Atomic grape tomato. And then we've grown the Midnight Snack cherry tomato. That's one of my favorites. Actually, I take that back. The Firefly, the yellow one is my favorite. This one's my second favorite. Um, so it'll be, it'll like have the green underneath and it'll be purple, but it's ready when the red is underneath like that. Um, so this is Aunt Ruby's German green tomato. This is an example of what it looks like right now. Um, with our really hot days, it's kind of um, either overwatering or underwatering. Um, it's kind of caused some stress to the plant. So you can see the top half is, um, kind of stressed and hopefully it can recover, but we'll see. But um, this certain variety is a green one and you can tell when it's ready um, because you can squish it and it'll be kind of soft. And then lastly, we have a yellow pear tomato. Um, it's cool, but it isn't as sweet as other ones. It doesn't have as much flavor. 
And then here we have some basils. Um, they all smell different, but the same, if that makes any sense. Like the lemon has a little bit of tint to it. This one has super cool dark purple foliage on it, the cardinal basil, and then the Thai basil. And in the middle, we have some more borage. And Dr. Lang actually taught me that you can eat the flowers off of borage. So um, now I always let them try it out. Um, so we have some more kale, lettuce, and bok choy. Um, I think these are just all like super cool and unique. Um, a lot of people like to saute the bok choy too, um, put it in stir fries. Um, we often get asked where does our produce go? Um, every Tuesday and Thursday, we have kids from the great after school place. They come into the gardens and they get to explore. We like to take them in there and kind of show them how to, the whole process of um, harvesting the produce. And it's kind of cool because they get exposed to a lot of fruits and vegetables that they might not have seen. Um, so it's kind of cool that they get to try that. And then starting this year, we are going to be taking our um, produce to the Brickings Backpack Project. Um, they have, they send out lots of backpacks out to students or kids each week. And um, we might not be able to feed all of them with our produce, but a little, little bit helps. And then we often get asked where we get our seeds from. Johnny's and Ivy Garth are um, a big two that we get, but the main one for the vegetable garden is Baker Creek. Um, they have a lot of the unique varieties, especially. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then if anyone's ever interested in coming to the gardens and seeing more, I didn't get to all of them today. So you might have to come in person if you are able, but here's the admission rates. And then we are open seven days a week um, from 10 to 6 p.m. And then anyone who was able to join us for our Garden Discovery Festival in May, thank you for joining us. It was super awesome. Um, uh, our next event we'll have coming up is Garden Party and Garden Expo on August 4th and 5th. Is there any All questions? All right. Thank you so much, Sydney. Those were gorgeous photos. And if anyone has questions for Sydney, please drop those in the chat. We're, we're happy to address those. And maybe while folks are thinking for a minute, Sydney, um, any advice for, you know, or any tips and tricks for how you got your raised beds and the vegetable garden ready to go for the season? Like, do you top dress with compost? Do you stir up that soil? It looked like you maybe had some different weed management strategies. So um, what should people know about um, things you found works well at McCrory Gardens for managing your soil and keeping down those weeds if we're staying thematic from Hannah to you? Yes, um, so our big bed that we have our peppers and tomatoes in, we take like a tiller in there, but the other raised beds that we have, um, we just kind of mix up the soil. And if we lost any, we add in some more. Um, but for weeds, um, kind of learned last year, we put in some straw, but then we later figured out that the straw had some grass seed in it. <laughs> so we had to pull out all that grass seed. So make sure you get um, so some straw that doesn't have grass seed in it. <laughs> but otherwise we take um, grass clippings and kind of put that over the soil to help control the weeds a little bit. Awesome. Very helpful advice on making sure you're trying to look for um, weed free and seed free straw whenever possible. So Sydney, um, we do have one listener who's curious if you can back up a few slides to that, where do you get your seeds from? So they could jot down those ideas. And while, while we have that up, um, any other advice or, you know, is there any rhyme or reason to like how you pick what veggies go in the garden or is it just trying to trial new ones or that looks interesting or, you know, what's that process over the winter when you're deciding what to plant? Um, so Amy and I, Amy's the horticulturist, or um, the curator and horticulturist, and um, we kind of look at what um, seeds are available, especially on Baker Creek, and see which ones we want to try, or what ones we liked last year and want to try again, or we didn't like. 
Um, we just kind of pick out and then she orders them and then we just plant them. But um, one thing we do do when we um, kind of plan out where we're going to plant stuff, we try to not plant the same plant in the same bed each year. So like if we had tomatoes in one, um, we won't plant another tomato in there. Excellent. And Sydney, I'm going to I'm going to pitch this one to you first, because I know you're still planting things at McCrory as well, and then I might weigh in as well. But we have a listener who has had some space open up in the garden and we've all been there either either you made more space or maybe something didn't work out the first time. So what can still be planted as we think about our vegetable gardens. Um, what can still be planted. Um, if you want to direct sow some seeds, you could do some carrots. Um, so plant those directly in the ground. Um, otherwise, we mainly transplant ours and we get like a head start on it. So it's kind of hard to tell what can be grown now. Otherwise, um, direct sowing those carrots, beets, radishes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, do you have any more ideas? Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm happy to weigh in as far as vegetables go. Um, I would 100% agree with, you know, getting some carrots or honestly waiting kind of for this, let's get past 4th of July and then direct sowing some of those cool season crops um, as we get into August, for example, and we start cooling back down into September, October, beets, radishes, there's great opportunities, spinach, kale, arugula, a lot of those leafy greens that we like to eat. Um, still great opportunities for direct sowing, you know, August and having some fall, cool season fall crops. Peppers and tomatoes, if you get a chance to snag from them from some from the garden center and get them in the ground in the next couple of weeks, I think you're going to be in pretty good shape. You know, you might not get, depending on where you are in the state, it might, you might get a, a light frost that kills some things before you get a lot of crops but I'll be the first to admit that we, my lab group, did not expect as hard of a freeze the day, the night that McCrory covered their plants. We did not cover our plants because I thought 40 degrees, the peppers are going to be okay. Surely it's not going to freeze. And then we woke up to frost the next day. So we replanted our pepper transplants and we'll actually be putting those out into the field next week. So I just share that you are not alone. Um, things that fruit quickly and, um, you know, readily like cucumbers, we're going to be transplanting out some cucumbers and looking for a, a fall crop. And remember that many of our commercial vegetable producers do succession plantings of crops too, where they're trying to get things ready nice and early for all of you listeners, but they'll also do some later plantings so that you have some new cucumbers or some new zucchini and some other crops a little bit later into the season as well. So, um, if you've got some space opened up, I would say go ahead and get some things out there. You could still definitely direct sow squash or summer squash or cucumbers, but you might want to look for some early maturing varieties. That would be my advice if you're starting to feel pressed for time and you're not going to get it in until like the 4th of July. Look for some vegetables that are labeled as early maturing. But again, take advantage of the sales at the garden center. And if you've got tall, leggy tomatoes, bury those stems nice and deep on the tomatoes because they'll root along that stem and they'll be nice and sturdy. And this is a good reminder that I maybe should bring some photos of my vegetable garden next week. Well, thank you, Sydney. This was really inspiring and it's nice to kind of have that vegetable theme. And to close us out tonight, I'm gonna do kind of just a, a question grab bag. So Sydney, I'll let you close up your screen and my my session tonight is just inspired by some very current and some former plant mysteries that I wanted to share with you because we're to that point in the season where we're encountering maybe a couple of plant problems and so I wanted to share some current ones. I also want people to rest assured that John and Amanda are both going to be back with us next week on garden hours. So um, those tree questions, and I know there's some different insects popping up across the state, so just know that John and Amanda are both going to be back here next week. We're also going to have an update from Laura Edwards on the climate outlook, which we might all be very interested in as well. Now, 
This is a slide I like to use whether I'm talking to master gardeners or home gardeners or even, even my students. This is actually a list that I kind of generated while I was in graduate school myself. But when it comes to solving plant mysteries, I know you're maybe looking at this and feeling overwhelmed, but these are some of the things you might want to ask yourself or take notes on, you know, as much information as you can. Of course, you might not know the answers to all these questions, and that's okay. And you might notice if you reach out to a master gardener or a friend or SDSU extension or the garden hotline that we might ask you some of these questions. So just don't be surprised if these are some of the things we ask you about because all of this information can help us figure out what might be going on with your plant or what's going on or what insect is causing the damage or what other factor might be affecting your plant. Um, more often than not, when I get a question, sometimes I have it in my head, okay, I know this is the solution. I've seen this a hundred times. But sometimes it's like, oh, wait a minute, it could be A, B, or C. And so I try to go through these questions and do some diagnostic tests to figure out what in the world might be going on. And or I loop in a friend. So phoning a friend, also very common in extension. But I just share this with you, you know, as you're encountering you know, maybe some plant mysteries of your own in your garden. Walk through this list because sometimes answering some of these questions will help you feel empowered to search for the answer, or it'll be really helpful when you visit with one of us to help you walk through it. Along that line, a friendly reminder for everyone who's listening that we love getting you know, your photos of your plant issues or the mystery insect, but having nice, clear, close-up photos whenever possible is really helpful. If it's a photo of an insect, I know Amanda Bachman really appreciates if there's a quarter or a pen or your your thumb or something in the in the photo for scale so we can try to tell how large the insect is. Videos, far less helpful. We really do prefer just nice, clear photos. It's nice to have a close-up, you know, what is the issue? Let's say it's a row of peonies because you're about to see one of those in a few slides. Um, you know, what does the healthy plant look like? Is it one healthy plant and 10 unhealthy ones or vice versa? So some photos that help tell that story can really help us dig into those plant mysteries. So um, here are a few of the mysteries we've received at Extension um, quite recently. This one was very recently. This was last week. Um, and it was, why are my squash and beans dying? And some of the information was, is it was last week. There, you know, had been some field spraying in the neighborhood for, for commercial crop production. Um, they had been watering with a soaker hose one to two hours per week in this garden. And we can see that there's mulch and use of landscape fabric, all great op options, especially during these hot, dry conditions. And this person was spraying neem oil several times a week um, due to some concerns with possible insect pests. So the question was, do we think it was spray damage? Do we think it was insect damage or was it something else? So my follow-up question for this person um, included, can you give us some close-ups of the leaves? Are you seeing any small pencil thin insects that are yellow? And those would have been thrips. So I will share going back to the first photos that um, some of this damage here could have been damage from thrips and Amanda Bachman put out a nice article about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, but in hot dry conditions, especially in mid-May, we were up to our eyeballs in thrips and they do really enjoy feeding on beans. So some of this could have been early damage from thrips, but we don't think that was what was the continuation of the damage. Um, this type of drying and curling of leaves, if you would have told me that you sprayed Roundup right next to your garden, I might have been worried. Um, but this type of damage and drying, I visited with a couple of colleagues and we didn't think it had anything to do with the field spraying in the near neighboring area. Now, a reminder to everyone who's listening, be extra cautious with using herbicides around your yard, especially in these hot, dry conditions. Um, pay attention to labels. A lot of the products will say, do not spray above a certain temperature threshold. A, because it's less effective on the weeds you're trying to kill. And B, you can cause a lot more damage to unintended targets, such as your vegetable garden. So um, do keep an eye out for that. We do have an article about that on our extension website as well. And we have a new weed specialist who is going to um, maybe put out some new advice or recommendations. So keep an eye on the newsletter. 
So all of that to say, we've ruled out ongoing insect damage and we've ruled out direct spray damage in this case. The thing that concerned me is oftentimes, especially if we transplant out our tomatoes, our peppers, our flowers, when we first transplant them out, as many of you know, they have those teeny tiny root balls. And you know they're only drawing water from that first inch or two inches of soil, and that dries down really quickly. So one of the things that concerned me in this case was only watering a couple times per week. As plants establish and those root, that root system grows and it's reaching deeper into the subsoil, the deep infrequent watering, yes, great plan. Um, but one of the things that concerned me in this case is that the plants maybe were a bit water stressed. And then if we had some hot windy days and you combine that with a product like neem oil, um, which can actually cause some, um, you know, prevent proper, you know, water movement through the plant. Um, we, in this case, fucked it up to heat damage. And I wanted to share a couple more photos of heat damage plus transplant shock. So now these are my own photos. Uh, well, I wanna give credit for the photo on the right. That was from my student, Alexis Barnes, who too was a little concerned what was going on with her squash. Cause you can see this sad leaf right here. This was newly transplanted out um, last week. Um, no, the week before last. And so this was one week after transplanting. And so similar conditions where that root ball was tiny, you can see we're using a low volume drip irrigation tape in the photo. And in a couple of spots that drip tape was scooched a little bit um, further away from that, that root ball of the squash. And so we decided to you know move those drip lines closer, make sure that you're really saturating that topsoil. Because as I tugged on those plants, it was just starting to root outside of you know the transplant root ball. So be patient with your plants, make sure you're monitoring water, especially for young transplants. And that original leaf that's dying back right there, I would chalk that up to transplant shock. The thing that I tend to look at with squash is, or you know my peppers or my tomatoes, how does the new growth look? And in this case, it looks healthy. You can see that new leaf is nice and green. It's emerging like normal. Um, so. I have full faith in Alexis's squash. It looks great and she's doing a great job managing it. The other thing to think about, um, you know, where are some of these plants in proximity to sidewalks or the edges of beds? This is some nasturtium on campus. And I intentionally walked to this flower bed to look for photos. And you can see that there's some scorched leaves on the edges. And right here, there's that concrete edge where it's soaking up more of that heat. Those leaves are maybe laying on that um, concrete edge. So that's typical leaf scorch. And again, these, this is a new planting and it's still rooting in. Um, I've seen cases, uh, you can see this photo here from this article of things like beans. They, on those hot windy days, if they can't move enough water from the soil through the entire leaf, that leaf edge is where that a lot of that water is leaving. And so that's the first part that's sacrificed in order to save the rest of the plant. Um, so in cases like this where you're seeing maybe some of that leaf scorch, I tend to say don't remove the leaves if they're still green tissue because that's still photosynthesizing and still supporting the rest of the plant. If the leaf is totally crunchy and it's going to fall off anyways, yeah, sure, break it off. Um, if the plant has completely dried down and wilted and there's no green tissue left, wait a few days to see if you get a new leaf. If not, might be time to consider that some bare space in the garden and replant. Um, but if it's just a few leaves here and there and you have new growth coming, like I showed you with Alexis's squash, I would not worry. Just consider upping your watering until those plants are rooted in and then start to taper down to deep and infrequent. Um, and it takes more water than you think, especially if you're overhead wa overhand watering with a garden hose. Um, I still remember as a young kiddo helping my dad water in the flowers and I, the soil all looked wet on the surface and I thought I was done and I was really proud of myself. And he took his players and digged around in the soil and showed me that I had irrigated about that deep into the soil. And so I had to be patient and water longer. So um, don't be afraid to use the old the thumb, the pliers, um, a pencil, dig around in that soil and see how far down into that soil you're actually watering. Um, that can be really, really helpful. All right, plant mystery number two. 
Again, I know right now my East River perspective is everything is dry, the grass is going dormant. Um, I realize our West River friends, and depending on where you are, you have had some awesome rainfall and it's been more like, okay, the weeds are going bonkers and I've had no time to get into the garden. So feel free to send any of your rain this way, but I know you too have been dry for a long time, so I'm very glad you're getting the rain. So all of that to say, there is one green thing that remains in a lot of the lawns um, that I've seen, not only in Brookings, but I noticed this weed out in Hot Springs when I was out there last weekend for Master Gardener training. And so I'm seeing it pop up on the gardening blogs is what is all over my yard? Um, so it showed up uh, a week or so ago. It's got this lovely little flower. Here are some nice close-ups. And depending on um, who you are and who you ask in South Dakota, this plant goes by a couple of names. Um, more commonly, especially if you ask our, our farming colleagues or our agronomy colleagues, they call it field bindweed. And it's important to note that this plant is in the morning glory family and it loves to spread by rhizomes. So there's under, believe it or not, there's underground stems. You have that vi those vines climbing over the surface. It's rooting in along the surface. If you have tomato trellis or a high tunnel or a fence and it grabs a hold of that, it'll just spiral right up that sucker. Um, so this can be a really, really irritating weed. Now, some people do call this creeping Jenny. Now, um, I, I've noticed recently on the garden blogs that if the people who are calling it Creeping Jenny and then posting control articles, there many of them are actually sending an article to Lismachia, totally different plant. We actually, in many cases, will plant that as an ornamental and it's that bright green kind of coin shaped um, leaf trailing down in our containers, although that can run amok in gardens too. Um, but I just want to clarify that I'm seeing a lot of people talk about Creeping Jenny and um, the articles they're sharing are actually about a completely different plant. So just know that this is um, Convovulpus arvensis. Um, and again, field bindweed would probably be the best thing to look up and it should look like morning glory flowers. Now, all of that to say, what do I do? It's taking over my lawn. It's the only green thing in my lawn. Um, I would advise, and this is again at the advice of our, our weed specialist, um, past and current, um, going out and trying to knock it down with herbicides right now is not going to be very effective. Whereas spraying in the fall as plants are, um, as the broadleaf plants are going dormant and drying reserves, this is a perennial plant, so it's drying those reserves back into the root, um, those broadleaf herbicides are going to be way more effective. Um, if it's running amok in your garden, yes, you can run a tiller through it and it'll temporarily take care of the problem. But again, this spreads by rhizomes, it roots in really easily. So if you have it all over and you run a tiller through it, you're actually just chopping that plant into teeny tiny bits and making it even worse. So depending on how severe your problem is, um, you know, Trying to pull it out if you're a patient person or you have a young person, you can pay them a dollar for everyone they pull out. Um, you know, sometimes those mechanical controls such as hand removal can be helpful. Using tactics, light soil tarping, if you have a problematic area can be really helpful or pulling out as much as you can and using a deep bed of mulch will help keep the problem at bay. I will be the first to admit that I have seen field bindweed crawl through some pretty deep mulch beds. So um, this is one that's maybe gonna take a multi-layered approach. And again, we have a nice article with some more steps on the extension website. And if you're someone who really enjoys identifying weeds in South Dakota, know that we have this lovely little green book that can be purchased um, from online sources. I know you can actually purchase it from the Agricultural Heritage Museum, I believe but it's um, South Dakota weeds, and this is a great ID tool. But again, don't be afraid to send us your questions as well. All right, and last but not least, I just wanna share this one really quickly. Mystery number three, why isn't my beloved peony blooming? Um, this one came to me a couple of years ago, actually, but it might be something that others have noticed because our peonies 
depending on where you are in the state, are either at peak bloom or just getting to peak bloom or about to get there. Um, so if you had a peony that's long established and didn't bloom this year, um, consider how old is that planting? Has, you know, was it planted 20 years ago by a teeny tiny tree and now it's a big, huge shade tree and so that peony is being shaded? Um, this one had a combination of factors. Um, it had grown for 20 plus years. There was a large tree in the yard, so I think there might have been some shading at play. But there can be a variety of factors that result in your peony not blooming. Um, if those rhizomes are planted too deep in the soil, so if they're buried more than a couple of inches, um, that can actually affect peony blooming because um, peonies have those big, it almost looks like a ginger root, like a nice, huge, big, gnarly, knotty, you know, horizontal stems. Um, if you are someone who loves fertilizing your perennials, you might have a really green, beautiful peony and no blooms. So um, you shouldn't really need to fertilize your peonies um, unless you're noticing like severe nitrogen deficiency or unless the soil test indicates doing something's in order. Um, you know, it too shady. Were the buds damaged? You know, if with some of those late season um, frost events, if those buds were already starting to form, we could have seen some bud damage there. Or in this case, um, you know, a 20 year old planting, I was very concerned that it was time to divide and we just needed to, you know, get rhizomes with three to four new shoots and divide that peony. Um, it is best to divide peonies about every 10 years. You can do it sooner if they're really overgrowing an area quickly. Um, there's some awesome advice on how to divide peonies. And again, it kind of digs into these, why aren't my peonies blooming? It was an article that was originally written by Dr. David Graper, and I had a chance to just put some fresh photos in there and add a few more tips and tricks. Um, so if you want some more advice for peonies, I'd encourage you to dig deeper on that extension article. And if you're someone who enjoys reading about perennials, I just want to share that one of my favorite books is this Herbaceous Perennial Plants. It's, it was authored by a retired faculty from the University of, he spent some, a lot of time in Georgia, so a bit of a Southern perspective, but there's some great advice for Northern perennials as well. And if you are looking at this and thinking, gosh, I think it might be time to divide my peony, please don't do it right now. Enjoy those blooms, let that peony store up those reserves during the summer and plan to divide that peony in September or October. So um, enjoy that luscious growth right now and wait till fall to divide that peony. And here's that article, um, if you find that helpful. And I realize garden hour, again, is quickly drawing to a close. So I just wanna remind people you are not alone in your plant mysteries. You are always welcome to submit questions, photos to our plant diagnostic clinic with Dr. Madeline Fires and Connie Tandy, the diagnostician in the lab. Um, so feel free to email them. All the contact information is on our website. They have a new lab lo location here on campus, but they are still providing the same awesome service, helping you dig into your questions. And if there's a case where you need to submit a plant sample to help get to the bottom of the mystery, there is a small fee attached to that, but they'll walk you through the entire process to um, figure out what in the world is going on with your plant. Um, I wanna remind everyone that a lot of the articles I shared tonight can be found in our garden and yard newsletter. So if you haven't had a chance to subscribe, we would certainly love have you join our newsletter. We try to send out our timely articles every other week. And also a shameless plug for those of you who love following along with John Ball and knowing, you know, what tree and shrub and insect associated insect problems are going on. Make sure you sign up for his tree pest alert as well. And finally, I just want to remind everyone that we have four garden hotlines that you can contact across the state of South Dakota. And again, this is the front lines for diagnosing our plant mysteries. And I see that I have a closing question of how did, did the extreme heat affect peony blooming? My buds never opened this year. Um, if they never opened at all, um, I'm either thinking, yes, they might've gotten zapped in the, the spring and so they didn't fully form and open, 
but um, heat stress would cause um, flower abortion or delayed bloom. I've heard a similar question related to daylilies within the last week. So keep your perennials watered folks and um, keep an eye on your plants and don't be, don't be surprised if we see things like tomatoes and peppers dropping blooms as well because um, so we might not have as an abundant of a fruit set because even if we keep things super well watered at certain high temperatures, especially with our fruiting crops like tomatoes and peppers, they're just going to drop some of those blooms because the plant cannot hang on to all of them. So great question. I know it's I know it's stressful with the heat, but hang in there. I I know that you are all resilient gardeners and we're gonna get through it. I do want to send um, a thank you and a shout out to Sydney and Hannah. We really appreciated having you on tonight. And a reminder that the Garden Hour crew, a lot of the familiar faces will be back next week. So we will look forward to having you join us again next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain. And I hope everyone has an excellent week. Keep those plants watered, keep yourselves watered, and maybe enjoy those early mornings or late afternoons in the garden. Um, and everyone have a wonderful evening. Thanks once again for joining us.